Good morning, everybody. A very warm welcome to Google Mughal Tent for 2014 Jaipur Literature Festival, Z Jaipur Literature Festival. I hope you're enjoying in spite of the cold and all. We are ready for our session now. The session is History Strikes Back and the Collapse of Globalism. It's Hubert Vidrain and John Rolson. They will be in conversation. May I welcome the authors here onto the stage? I think they are still discussing their session. Please. I'll just remove my hair. Are you okay like that? Yeah, I guess so. I will set you on the session. C'est un public très sophistiqué. Très sophistiqué, avec beaucoup de curiosité. Oui, oui. Comme ça, vous n'avez pas besoin d'écrire. Je vais quand même écrire. Peut-être. Non. Pour ne rien oublier. Non, mais je ne peux faire phrase par phrase, c'est plus vivant. Non. Hi, William. Great. How are you? I don't know where we are. Is there a, there's no introduction? We're just starting? Yeah. All right, sorry. We're just starting. That's fine. So, um, uh, uh, Hubert Vedrine, John Ralston Saul, who's going to be translating for uh, Monsieur Vedrine. And uh, we're just, we're missing Shashi, obviously, which we're very, very sorry about. But uh, we thought we'd just have a chat. And uh, I think. We're going to try to talk about history, uh, the end of globalization, and, and I think where we might, you know, I think the idea was we might start, I, I fear we agree, which is always a problem, but that uh, there was a guy called Fukuyama, who was theoretically a professor at a university in the United States, who wrote one of the stupidest books written in the last 25 years, in which, you know, he declared the end of something which doesn't end, and the amazing thing is that when history didn't end, he didn't resign as a professor. He just wrote another book which was equally stupid. Um, so he's got a great career going with people, you know, it's sort of like a medieval magic show where you just, people keep dying of your cures and you keep producing new cures. And so he makes quite a bit of money out of that, you know. And, uh, I don't know if you have other thoughts about him. Did you understand or do you need translation for this? D'abord, je vais m'exprimer en français parce que je comprends bien, mais mon anglais n'est pas au même niveau. I'll be talking in French. Uh, though I do understand very well, I cannot speak as well as I understand. Et, Moi, on m'a demandé de, de vous parler du, justement de ma, de ma vision sur la fin de l'histoire. Uh, I have just been asked to speak about my viewpoint on the end of history. Et je suis d'accord avec vos remarques ironiques. 
sur Fukuyama. I totally agree with your ironical remarks on Fukuyama. Without your irony, we would have to take him seriously. <laughs> Mais je pense, évidemment, je vous présente ici un point de vue européen et en particulier français. Uh, but of course, I'm expressing uh, a, a European and uh, particularly French point of view here. Et je pense que les Européens d'aujourd'hui pensent comme Fukuyama. And I believe that uh, the Europeans of today uh, think uh, like Fukuyama. Même avant Fukuyama, ils sans le connaître. Even before Fukuyama, without even knowing him. En français, on dirait ils sont Fukuyamesque. In French, we would say they are Fukuyamesque. Et qu'est-ce que je veux dire par là Quand Fukuyama a dit, c'est la fin après la fin de l'Union soviétique. Uh, what I'm trying to say is, uh, I'm talking about what Fukuyama said after the end of the Soviet Union. Il a dit c'est la fin de l'histoire puisqu'on est tous d'accord maintenant sur la démocratie et le marché. He said that uh, it's the end of history because all of us had an agreement about democracy and the market. Clinton disait la démocratie de marché. Clinton used to say market democracy. Et vous rappelez que Huntington a répondu. If you remember, uh, Huntington. Huntington. Huntington Sam, Sam had Huntington. answered. En disant, mon pauvre ami, vous vous trompez. Said, my poor friend, you are uh, totally wrong. Euh, malheureusement, ce n'est pas la fin de l'histoire tragique. Unfortunately, it's not the <coughs> end of tragic history. Parce qu'il y a trop de différences entre les civilisations. Because there are too many differences between civilizations. <coughs> Et tous les esprits, euh, disons, universalistes, ont été horrifiés par la pensée d'Huntington. Uh, and all universalist uh, mindsets were horrified by the uh, ideas of uh, Huntington. 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 Et pendant les années euh, Clinton. And during Clinton's uh, years. C'est la pensée de Fukuyama qui l'emportait. It was uh, Fukuyama's thought which reigned supreme. À partir du 11 septembre, from 11 September onwards, l'Occident a commencé à penser que peut-être une Tington avait raison, malheureusement. Uh, that is when the West woke up to the thought that maybe Huntington was right. Bon, voilà, c'est un vaste débat. This is a huge debate. Moi, je suis intervenu là-dedans il y a quelques années en I... écrivant un essai. I came into this just a few years back uh, when I wrote a book, uh, um, an essay. Pour dire l'histoire va continuer. To say that history will continue. Avec ses côtés magnifiques et ses côtés tragiques. With its magnificent uh, sides and its tragic side. Mais elle risque de continuer sans les Européens. But uh, it might uh, carry on without Europeans. C'était pas un raisonnement économique. Mm -hmm. Mine was not an economic uh, reasoning. Pourquoi je disais ça? Why did I say that? Les Européens modernes, ils croient dans la communauté internationale. Modern Europeans believe in the international community. Ils pensent qu'on peut régler les conflits dans le cadre des Nations Unies. They believe that uh, conflicts can be settled within the framework of the United Nations. Ils pensent que les gentilles euh, organisations non gouvernementales vont pouvoir euh, imposer de bonnes choses aux méchants gouvernements. Uh, they believe that uh, the very nice NGOs can impose good things on bad uh, governments. Ils pensent que la, la Cour pénale internationale va surveiller les méchants, they punir, believe punir les méchants. The, uh, they believe that the International uh, Penal Court will punish the bad ones. Et donc, moi, ce que j'ai écrit... So what I wrote was, Évidemment, c'est un résumé euh, un peu caricatural, mais bon. I'm making it really short, but. Et ce que j'ai écrit, c'est que euh, toutes ces idées sont très sympathiques. What I wrote was that all these ideas are very nice and sympathetic. Ce sont de, de nobles aspirations. These are very noble thoughts and aspirations. Mais le monde n'en est pas là du tout, en fait. But we are not there at all in the world. Et donc, là, en fait, il y a une compétition féroce dans le monde. There is a, a fierce competition in the world. 
Il suffit de regarder l'Asie, l'Asie d'aujourd'hui et de demain, par exemple. All that one needs to do is to look at in uh, Asia of today or and Asia of tomorrow. Voilà. Et donc je vais, je vais pas être encore une phrase. Euh, moi, je pense que les Européens d'aujourd'hui doivent admettre qu'il y a encore un problème de rapport de force dans le monde. Ça n'a pas disparu. Uh, I think that um, Europeans of today have to admit that uh, there is um, still um, a power struggle in the world which is there and which exists. Et que, euh, il faut garder une certaine puissance. And that they should keep a certain amount of power. Il faut euh, en faire un, un usage euh, intelligent et pacifique. Il faut quand même garder une puissance. They should uh, hold on to a little bit of power, even if they make uh, uh, a peaceful and intelligent use of it. Sinon, l'avenir de l'Europe sera dicté non pas par les Européens, mais par euh, les autres puissances et les nouvelles puissances. Otherwise, the future of Europe is going to be determined not by Europeans, but by other powers and the new powers. Voilà, une réflexion. You know, I, I, you know, I think we basically agree. I mean, the, but. I mean, the Huntington Fukuyama thing is really interesting in a deeply uninteresting way, right? Uh, that you have this bitter old man who's become frightened of race and religion, and then you have this guy, I've already said what I think of him, um, and in a way they represent the Rome of the day trying to figure out what to do with its victory. The, the sort of, the, the, the naively optimistic and the bitterly fearful pessimistic. Right. You know, a war of civilizations versus we've got it now, we're in charge, and there will be no more history because everyone agrees. And, of course, they're sort of two opposites. Neither of them are true. In, in a funny way, Huntington is the more guilty party because he was actually a, a man of consequence. And it's really tragic that at the end of his life he should write a book which was an incitement to violence. You know, there's no other way to talk about what he wrote except, um, you know, we've got to fight somebody. We don't have any other idea of civilization except to fight someone. And since there are no communists let's to fight, let's, let's have a religious war or a racial war or whatever. And uh, so I, th I think, if he were, I, I said this when he was alive, I repeat it now that he's dead, I think that what he did at the end of his life will go down as a deeply, I don't know, you could almost say a deeply evil act. Because intellectuals have an obligation not to act, if possible, in an evil way. We can be controversial, we can be, uh, cause enormous arguments, but it was actually a provocation and became a justification, I think, in, for many people in the democracies and outside of the democracies to act badly. Um, and it also shows the confusion in Washington in the United States uh, about what to do with their situation. Uh, and I think particularly you quite rightly said you were making a non-economic analysis But behind that non-economic analysis, nevertheless, there is this reality that from the 1970s on, the West was faced by an enormous economic crisis, and we made a choice, the West, that we would go down a road to avoid the crisis, which in my opinion was really a diversion. That we, When we look back on this, we'll say that from 75 to 2000 was a sort of attempt to avoid... What is the diversion? The, well, the diversion was globalization. Was an attempt... To, there, there are good things and bad things and everything, but it was an attempt to avoid the real problems which came to the surface in the early and mid-70s. And by doing that, the West w lost traction. It didn't know what to do with its power. And when that started not to work, Uh, people came up with a brilliant idea that they could relaunch the Western economies by, in a sense, encouraging India and China to be part of this globalist movement. Very naive idea of how to reinforce the West. I mean, they just simply didn't understand what they were letting loose. And they also thought somehow that, that India and China would play by the Western rules when the Western rules were designed to serve the West, which is a bit what you're saying about, about uh -huh. Europe. So yes, I think we're, you know, the globalist movement has basically come to an end. We're moving into a regionalist period, which is more or less, I think, what you're saying, is that there's an enormous competition going on out there. And the question is, how far will it go? How, 
Will it, will it slip into greater and greater violence, or will we figure out a way to use this regionalism in an interesting manner? And I suppose Europe has to have a debate about how to handle that, just as the United States does, and then other countries like mine, Canada, have to figure out where we fit into it all. Do we simply just go on with the Americans, or do we actually try and find other ground, which is interesting ground, between all these blocks? And that, I don't think, is clear yet. Alors, deux, deux remarques. I have two remarks to make. Euh, D'abord, je reviens sur Huntington, une seconde. I am getting back to Huntington. Euh, C'est évident que sa pensée était dangereuse. It is quite obvious that his uh, thought was dangerous. Mais cela dit, il faut être honnête, Huntington ne disait pas, il faut organiser le clash des civilisations. Uh, but uh, one has mm. to be uh, honest yeah. and admit that he did not uh, call for, he did not ask uh, uh, for, for community clashes to, to be organized. No, no, the civilization. Clash of civilizations. Clash of civilizations to be organized. He yeah. said, attention, il y a un risque. He <coughs> said, be careful, there is a risk. Nous sommes pas encore dans la civilisation universelle parfaite. Donc, il y a encore un risque. C'est ce qu'il disait. Since we are not yet uh, in a perfect universal um, uh, civilization, the risk does exist. Et regardez le Moyen-Orient, par exemple, le Middle East. Let's look at the Middle East. La situation au Moyen-Orient n'est pas due à Huntington. The situation in the Middle East is not because Huntington. of Huntington. Entre les, les Israéliens et les Arabes. Between the Israelis and the Arabs. Au sein du monde musulman. Within the Muslim world. Entre les Sunnites et les Chiites. Between the Shiites and the Sunnis. La, la compétition entre... Euh, Iran, Arabie, Turquie. Uh, the competition between Iran, uh, uh, Arabi, uh, Saudi Arabia and Turkey. Ça n'a rien à voir avec nos théories bonnes ou mauvaises. Mm. It has nothing to do with a good or bad theory. Alors, ma deuxième remarque, c'est euh, vers quoi allons-nous globalement? Uh, my uh, second remark is uh, vers quoi? Vers quoi le monde va-t-il? Uh, where is the word, uh, world heading? En géopolitique, à l'heure actuelle, il n'y a plus de théorie de, de, avec un consensus. Uh, as of now, as far as geopolitics go, there is no theory in existence which has wide consensus. Je reprends. La communauté internationale, c'est un objectif. Uh, to, res, to take, take it up again, the international community is a goal. It's an objective. No, pas, pas encore une réalité. It's not a reality yet. Les Occidentaux restent très, très, très puissants. Uh, the Western, uh, the world remains extremely powerful. Mais l'Occident n'a plus le monopole de la conduite des affaires du monde qu'il a eu pendant trois ou quatre siècles. Hmm. C'est fini. But it does not uh, anymore hold uh, a monopoly on the conduct of, um, uh, of business which it held. Non, pas business. Uh, uh, la conduite des de, 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 de décisions dans le monde. The, the How to run decisions things. in the world right, right, right. which it, it held for three to four centuries. Uh, est-ce qu'il y a, uh, est-ce que ce sont les émergents, les puissances émergentes qui vont gouverner le monde? Uh, will it be the emerging powers which will uh, govern the world? Non plus. That's not the case either. Il n'y aura pas d'accord entre l'Inde et la Chine They pour gouverner. Be... There will be no agreement between India and China. Quand on parle des BRICS, par exemple. When we talk about the BRICS. Brazil. Brazil. Russie. Russia. Inde. India. Chine. China. On ajoute South Africa. And South Africa. Et il y a encore 20 ou 30 émergents après. After that, you, we still have 20 to 30 emerging countries. Il y a des contradictions énormes. There are enormous contradictions. La Russie n'a rien à faire dans ce groupe. Russia has nothing to do in this group. Ce n'est pas un pays émergent, la Russie. It's not an emerging country, Russia. C'est un pays qui, a, qui surnage. It's a country which is uh, just uh, keeping itself afloat. Euh, bon, beaucoup de compétition. Lots of competition. Je ne crois pas non plus en un accord, c'est vrai, on parlait du G2. Je ne crois pas non plus dans un accord entre les États-Unis et la Chine. I also do not believe that there will be an agreement uh, between China and the United States. Ils sont interdépendants sur le plan économique. They are the, uh, on the economic plane, they are interdependent. Mais il y a une rivalité stratégique. 
but uh, there are strategic rivalities. Uh, on parle de monde, en tout cas en Europe, on parle de monde multipolaire. In Europe, we speak about uh, the a multipolar world. Les Américains n'aiment pas cette formule. Americans do not like this word. Kissinger le disait déjà il y a 30 ans. Kissinger used to, Kissinger used to say this uh, as early as th about 30 years back. Il y a les États-Unis au-dessus. Uh, there's United States right on the top. Et quel, quatre ou cinq autres puissances en dessous. And four or five other powers below, beneath it. Mais même le mot multipolaire, ce n'est pas forcément la, la bonne explication parce que personne n'est d'accord sur le nombre des pôles. Maybe um, uh, a multipolar world is also not a very good explanation because nobody has a clear idea about the number of poles. Par exemple, est-ce que les Européens veulent faire un pôle de puissance Ce n'est pas évident. Par uh, exemple, do the Europeans want to make a, a power pole That's also not very clear. Beaucoup d'Européens veulent faire une grande Suisse, en fait. Lots of Europeans mm. actually uh, want to make a big uh, Switzerland. C'est pour ça qu'il y a certains, certains analystes qui disent maintenant que c'est un monde zéro polaire. Il n'y a pas de pôle. That's why there are lots of, uh, there are a few analysts who uh, say that uh, there are no poles in the world. It's a zero polar world. Voilà, donc il n'y a pas d'explication dominante. So there is no dominant explanation. Plus euh, s'ajoute à ça la, la situation économique. And add, uh, let's, uh, if we add to that the sit, uh, economic uh, situation. La folie financière des, 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 des 15 ou 20 dernières années. La folie financière. Uh, the financial folly which we have witnessed over the uh, past 15 or 20 years. Où l'ensemble du système mondial a été transformé en un immense casino. The entire global system was reduced to transform to a, a, a global, uh, a, a, an enormous casino. Voilà, donc c'est difficile de trouver une explication consensuelle. Mm. So what I'm trying to say is what that it's think? difficult to find no. a consensual uh, explanation. Well, I mean, I think just to start with the end, the, the, the casino was a very important part of the avoidance of the crisis. So we had this collapse in the 70s, and economists couldn't figure out what to do. So they came up with two or three ideas. One was uh, to adopt as completely modern two mid-19th century English ideas, which were free trade and unregulated capitalism. So they, they took the two big enemies of the middle of the 19th century, which came from the, middle, the Midlands in England, and declared them to be a new global theory. I'm simplifying grossly, but that's about it. Mm. And of course, it had certain advantages. I mean, there was an attempt to uh, provoke growth through trade, and there's nothing wrong with trade, and there's nothing wrong with growth. The only problem was that there was already a surplus of goods, which was one of the basis of the crisis, that, that the great victory of capitalism and socialism was it had pr produced a surplus of goods. They weren't properly distributed, you know, either within countries or between countries, but actually, suddenly, you could imagine two cities in China producing enough goods for the world. So you actually don't need to have an economic system based on growth through an increase in production. You need to talk about how else can we produce, how else can we distribute, a whole other approach towards economics. Instead of that, they, they declared modernism and went back into the 19th century. But the second thing they did was, and it worked to some extent. I mean, India took some benefit out of it, China took some benefit out of it, but it wasn't a system that was leading anywhere. And the other side of it was really, uh, let's pretend, and this is always a sign of civilizations in deep trouble, the West, let's pretend that money is real. You can always tell when a civilization is in deep trouble which is they start to think that money is real, that it's not something that makes other things happen. It's not the grease of the wheels, it's actually the wheels itself. And so they started to pretend, since they couldn't get real growth out of real things, they decided they would get growth out of imaginary things, like money. So you got this incredible inflation. Um, you went from, and I can't remember the numbers now, uh, so I'll just make them up, which is what most economists do, um, uh, you know, you went from uh, re a relationship of money to all forms of money to real goods of 500 to 1 and then 
10 years later it was 2,000 to 1 and then it was 20,000 to 1. And this was all declared to be incredibly sophisticated Western modernism and this was how we through our sophistication were to keep leadership while lesser peoples in other parts of the world would go on making things. That's how we presented it to ourselves. It was all really quite delusional. Um, but you're absolutely right that, that we're at a stage now of disorder. I mean, we don't know where the power is going to be. We all know that three, four centuries ago, Asia represented what percent of the creation of wealth in the world? It was something like 50% or... Oui, but you know, it, it was, was before the globalization. Yeah, no, but I mean in, seven, seven, in 1700, uh, Asia had some... Th I've forgotten. Somebody here probably knows the numbers. It had 40 or 50% yes, we of wealth creation. Yes, but we were not creation. on the same planet. Hmm? We were not on the same planet. Well, except there was a lot of trade. And I think yes, yes. one shouldn't underestimate the amount of trade there was, in no. the, for example, in the late 19th century, between the empires, uh, how the empires organized themselves to move goods around the world, far more efficiently than in the late 20th century. I mean, the French Empire, the British Empire, had an incredibly sophisticated system for you know, raw materials, consumption, etc., really regulated to work at an international level. Keynes wrote a lot about that in 1919 when he resigned from the Versailles, British uh, delegation to Versailles and wrote his famous book, sort of a big protest book in 1919, where there's a whole section where he talks about globalization and how sophisticated the globalization of the empires was before the First World War. And, you know, what have we changed? A certain number of things, but it's not more sophisticated than what we're doing now. Anyway, your point, which I think is the right point, is it isn't at all clear where we're going. I mean, you can see Obama attempting to figure out if he does this, where will the power lie and how will people react. But last comment. Of course, Huntington didn't create a clash of civilizations. But what a writer of that level knows is there are three or four options out there, maybe five or six. And you have, if you're influential, you have the ability to encourage one of the options. So as a writer, looking at another writer, you say he really did not assume his responsibilities in his interpretation. He, he was not as careful. I think you're very kind in talking about how careful he was. In fact, what surrounded what he wrote and said was a campaign of fear, which I think has been partly responsible for making people feel that they can act badly, that he's one of the key people in allowing people emotionally and intellectually to act badly. But he's dead, so maybe it's, we shouldn't go on too much about him. <laughs> he peut pas répondre. <laughs> well, perhaps he can reply. He, he I can't don't know. reply. <laughs> uh, bon, what is the next? What happens next? Yes. What do you think? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm playing for time here. <laughs> Moi, je m'attends une longue compétition instable. I am expecting a long, drawn out, unstable competition. Avec des alliances variables. With variable alliances. Je pense que on, on est en train de un petit peu réencadrer la finance, un peu. I <coughs> feel bit. that right now we are slightly trying to uh, reframe finance. Euh, je, je vois pas bien de comment dire d'alternative à ce que vous dites, même si vous avez raison. Quelle est l'autre voie Well, uh, I'm not able to very clearly understand uh, the alternative that you are talking about. What is the other path, the other way Well, I think that, you know, uh, first of all, we all know that you have to begin by understanding what you're doing and has it worked and does it work and where does it lead. I mean, that's the first step. And I, I certainly think that in the West, there has not been a great admission of what's gone wrong. I mean, you and I can say there's a casino problem, etc. But when you actually look at the reaction to the financial crisis a couple of years ago, the changes are very small. Very small. I mean, the very fact that... that la, la, la règle Volcker? Yeah, the, but they're, little, they're the little things. And basically, when you look at things like the decision to move uh, through... Um, uh, I've forgotten the word now, suffering, uh, uh, shutting down, sh pulling, austerity, sorry, to mm. move through a route of austerity. I mean, austerity is a form of denial. There's no example in, you know, 2,000 years of austerity working as a major 
social economic policy. It's mm -hmm. good when you've got runaway inflation, you slam on uh, austerity for 12 months to stop the inflation, but you don't actually restructure economies through austerity. So they've done that, and you know we're seeing some of the results. Or you, you look at the decision, the way Europe and the United States and some others reacted to the financial collapse by trying to save the banks. I mean, histori the history of... Too, too big to fail. Well, I mean, it's just crazy. I mean, they could have taken half that amount of money and given it to the people who had mortgages. Mm. Pay off the mortgages, and then uh, the, actually by paying off the mortgages, you save the banks worth saving, and you stabilized your working class and your lower middle class. Instead of that, they did, because it showed how they could not admit how wrong they had been. And, and the other day, I was sitting in, in, in a room in the audience listening to Monsieur Trichet, the former head of the European Bank, a very smart man, and the new head of the Canadian National Bank talking about the crisis. And, and this is the answer to your question. They spoke for a half an hour about the crisis. And at no point did the word human being, citizen, people, civilization, existence. But the bankers are human beings. No, no, no. 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 It, it, they talked. <laughs> but the bankers they, are human beings. But they talked as if they weren't. It was the most astonishing thing that they right. actually had no idea that 500 people a day were, losing, were being thrown out of their houses and apartments in Spain, that over 50% of youth in Spain were unemployed, et cetera, et cetera. They were just talking as if it was a matter of bonds and interest rate levels. And, and they're, they're, they know perfectly well that as bankers, their responsibility is bigger than that. So I guess what I'm saying is that first we have to admit where we are. And secondly, we have to say, what are the strategic elements we can use to change this? which is what Huntington and Fukuyama were trying to do but failed at. So, I mean, I think one of them does have to do with attitudes towards the movement of peoples, where there's a, bit, there's a bit of a crisis in Europe and there's somewhat of a crisis in the United States and so on. I think there has to be a real discussion about how people can live together, a proper discussion which would lead to uh, positive attitudes, whereas what we're seeing is a rise in fear. I think that there's uh, attitudes on social economic questions which we could be acting on quite easily. For example, um, it's clear that the, uh, the 19th century globalist model is not producing what we need, so we should be looking at things like a different form of banking, perhaps more use of cooperative, uh, cooperative banking. There's one of the states in India has done extremely well with dairy, for example, has moved from with a crisis what? situation. With what? Dairy, with uh, dairy, le uh, okay. And not only have they produced stability in farming, but they're actually exporting, as opposed to other areas in India where they followed the Western industrial model, which has led to a crisis in agriculture, high levels of suicide and poverty, right? I mean, the Indians here will agree with me on this. So right. there's, a, there's a need to stand back and say, are the international institutions still pushing uh, elements, measurements, which are about uh, forms of agriculture, for example, that simply don't work? Forms of banking that simply don't work. Um, why aren't we, you know, we see today a growth in private education or, or the almost private education around the world. This is part of a return to a kind of class system. It's an outcome of the globalist period when we all know that the basis of democracy is highly functioning public schools. That when you get highly functioning public schools, you give citizens the way in, you know? Mm. These, are, the, these are the kind of things that in the 19th century and early 20th century, Political leaders, philosophers, thinkers, political movements said we have to organize in this way. We have to provide these kind of services. We have to get clean water into cities. Professor Sen opened this, um, this uh, 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 festival brilliantly, absolutely brilliantly, and he had a list of seven things which any fool like me, I won't speak for you, could understand, <laughs> you know? And it was, it was wonderful, and he talked about education. He talked about how many hundred million people in India don't have running water. And you could, you could say, well, if you don't have clean running water, you're, you're in Paris pre uh, um, uh, uh, Poubelle. The, you know, the, um, the, what are they called? The, uh, the préfet of Paris, the governor of Paris in what, 18... Uh, Mr. Poubelle. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes Mr. Yeah. Poubelle was the... <laughs> governor of Paris in 18... Préfet de police. Préfet de police. And he forced 
clean water and sewage collection, which changed the history of France in many ways, because once you had that, you had a different level of disease, you had the possibility of building a middle class. These are strategic things. He was considered to be a communist by the businessmen of the day because you had to pay taxes. You had to pay for your own uh, pipes in your buildings so your buildings could be tied into the sewer system. He did that, he produced cleanliness, and that was happening all around Europe and North America. That produced a kind of stability. Well, these are the sorts of things we could be doing today with education, with health care. Uh, we could be looking at uh, value-added approaches towards production as opposed to old-fashioned mass production, because old-fashioned mass production is not pr raising standards of living, because the value of the goods sold is too low for people to earn a living. So there, there are seven things, as Professor Se uh, said, there are a dozen things that can be done. They're very sensible, <coughs> they're very down to earth, and they would change, get us away from this atmosphere of fear which is growing in the world. Is that an answer? I don't know. <laughs> it's the beginnings of an answer. No, we progress. We pro <laughs> <laughs> I, I met Professor Sen yesterday yeah. evening uh, in Delhi. Uh, he nous a dit que l'Inde n'avait pas de leçons à recevoir de la Chine sur la démocratie. And he told us that India had no lessons to learn from China in the area of democracy. Ça c'est évident. Which uh, is obvious. Uh, ni sur l'état de droit. Not on the state of law. Rule of law. The rule of law. Uh, mais que l'Inde avait peut-être des leçons à prendre de la Chine sur uh, la politique sociale. But uh, India perhaps had uh, lessons to draw from China in the area of social policies. D'ailleurs, uh, la Banque Asiatique de Développement, the Asian Development Bank, écrit que uh, la Chine va éliminer dans uh, 15 ans. Uh, writes that China is près. going to eradicate uh, poverty within extreme, poverty, extreme poverty within 15 years, adverse poverty. Uh, bon, une remarque sur l'Europe. Uh, a remark on Europe. Je le dis exprès parce que, vu du point de vue de l'Inde, uh, la politique d'austérité en Europe est incompréhensible. I, I am stressing on this because seeing, uh, seen from India's point of view, the austerity measures in Europe will be quite incomprehensible. Mais en, en Europe, nous avons développé depuis uh, 1945 un système social très généreux et très protecteur. Um, in uh, Europe, uh, we have developed from 1945 onwards uh, so a highly generous and protective uh, social system. Sécurité sociale and so on. Social security and so on. Uh, maintenant, en France, par exemple, les dépenses publiques représentent 58%, 59% du produit intérieur brut. Uh, in France, for example, um, 58 to 59 percent of the GDP, uh, 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 I mean, uh, public expenditure accounts for almost 59 percent of the GDP. Nous sommes obligés d'emprunter environ 180 milliards d'euros par an pour maintenir ce niveau de protection sociale. And we have to borrow about 180 uh, billion euros in order to sustain this uh, social system. Vous voyez, c'est le contraire exact de, du problème indien. It is the exact uh, opposite of India's uh, problems and issues. Donc si on veut, pas défendre l'austérité, mais euh, défendre la, disons, la bonne gestion. Uh, I'm not defending austerity, but I'm defending a proper management. Si on veut sauver le système social de solidarité, il faut quand même réduire un peu le coût. Uh, if we want to save the, uh, solid, uh, the social system based on solidarity, we'll have to reduce the costs. Et, et dans les pays d'Europe où ça a été fait, and in European uh, countries la Suède where, ou autre, where it was done, such as Germany, Sweden and others, on vit aussi bien qu'en France. People live uh, as uh, well as people do in France. C'est-à-dire merveilleusement bien which means wonderfully well. Même si les Français sont toujours mécontents. Even if the French are always unhappy and discontent. Il y a un écrivain 
un écrivain français qui a dit « Les Français sont des Italiens de mauvaise humeur <rire> ». Bad, ill-humored, bad um, uh, Italians. They are Italians who are always in a bad mood. Bon, donc c'est une c'est une phase pour corriger, mais pour sauver le système. It's a, pas this pour le is a terre. phase uh, for rectifying and to save the system. Si la l'austérité devient une idéologie permanente, je suis d'accord avec vous. C'est mm. absurde. If uh, it becomes, if austerity becomes a permanent ideology, then I totally agree with you. That would be quite absurd. Alors maintenant, sur notre le cœur du débat, c'est-à-dire euh, où va le monde? Now coming back to the core of the debate about where the uh, world is heading to. Quand je dis moi, il n'y a pas encore de communauté internationale. When I say je that, je le dis à regret. When I say that uh, there is no international community as yet, I'm, I say it with a lot of regret. La Charte des Nations Unies est remplie de choses magnifiques. The uh, Charter of the uh, United Nations is filled with excellent things. Mais tout ça est à construire en fait. Donc qu'est-ce qu'on fait pour le construire? But everything, all this has to be built. And what do we do to build this? Et les deux fois dans l'histoire contemporaine où on a essayé d'organiser le monde sur une base, disons, idéaliste. And the two times that we tried, uh, uh, in the con contemporary history, we tried to organize the world around these idealistic uh, uh, notions. C'est après les deux guerres mondiales. This was after the two world wars. Quand on a créé la Société des Nations, When après the la Première Guerre. When the Society of Nations was created. Et les Nations Unies après la deuxième. Uh, that was after the first world war and the United Nations after the second world war. Alors que les nations ne sont pas unies en réalité, tout le monde But le sait. Though all of us know that nations are not united in reality. Et, mais je veux dire que ce sont les vainqueurs qui ont fait ça à chaque fois. But what I'm trying to say is that it was the winners who did this uh, each and every time. Trois ou quatre pays à chaque fois. Each time it was three or four countries which did it. Donc le problème d'aujourd'hui. Si on veut mettre de l'ordre dans ce chaos. The problem today, if we want to put some order in this chaos. Si on veut euh, dompter la, la folie financière. If we need to control uh, financial folly. J'ajouterai, si on veut réconcilier l'écologie et la croissance économique. And I would add, um, if we have to reconcile uh, environment and economic growth. Si on veut que toutes les civilisations du monde cohabitent de façon pacifique. If we want uh, all the civilizations in the world uh, to lead, uh, to cohabit, uh, to, uh, in, in a peaceful manner. Il n'y a pas de puissance qui puisse imposer ça. Yeah. There is no power which can impose this. Ce n'est même, euh, même plus les États-Unis. Yeah. It's not even the United States anymore. Moi, j'avais, à propos des États-Unis, il y a 15 ans, j'avais dit c'est une hyperpuissance. About 15 years back, speaking about the United States, I had called it a hyperpower. Mais ça a duré 10 ans. But it lasted 10 years. Et ça a complètement dérapé avec la politique de W. Bush. And it Absurde. went totally off. Um, it went totally off with the policies of uh, W. Bush. Donc, nous n'avons pas le choix pour élaborer un, une sorte de système mondial. So we do not have a, a, a choice to, uh, to elaborate, to make a, a global system. Bon, on est obligé de négocier. We are obliged to negotiate. Soit les 200 pays des Nations Unies. Either the 200 countries of the United Nations. Ou au moins les 20 pays du G20. Or at least the G20 countries. Qui sont d'ailleurs 25. Which are, by the way, bon. 25. Donc au moins, faut... C'est là où on peut négocier les choses. That is where we can negotiate things. Il y a toutes les anciennes puissances. All the old powers are there. Toutes les nouvelles puissances, dont l'Inde. All the new powers, including India. Donc pour moi, ce n'est pas un pouvoir, c'est juste une enceinte, un cadre. For me, uh, this is not a power, but it's a framework. Mais c'est là où on peut avoir un, un agenda à la fois idéaliste et réaliste, peut-être. Maybe this is the place where we can have an, uh, a program uh, which is at the same time realistic and idealistic. Mais ça ne règle pas la question économique dont vous parlez. 
But this doesn't settle the economic issue Quand that you are la, raising. La diversion vers la finance. Mm. The diversion in finance. Comme il y avait eu dans les années 30 la, la diversion vers les dépenses militaires. Mm. Like Alors, we saw in the 30s when there was diversion towards donc, military expenditure. Quel est le mode, le contenu de croissance qui n'est pas fou? So, uh, what about uh, how do we go towards a growth which is not crazy? Well. You know, I think that, that this is one of those moments, one of those really interesting moments when, you know, you have an elite structure, which is quite impressive. I mean, all over the world, actually. But it has essentially been unable to deal with this crisis over our lifetime. I mean, no matter how intelligent we are, we just haven't done very well. We've avoided a world war, so I guess we could say great about that. And we've done a certain number of things. But essentially, it hasn't really worked out as we thought it would. And I mean, I, I give a tiny example about how one needs to change the way we think. Europe has just passed a regulation which will begin to help deal with a problem which is worldwide, which is that the worldwide fishing industry throws 50% of the fish caught back in the water dead. And this is a limited good. Uh, of very high level value and it's simply thrown back dead for various reasons and what they catch the other 50% they catch and keep a large part is used for fertilizer which is using an expensive good for a cheap purpose or for pet food it's so w what a little story like that tells you is how much we need to rethink what we teach in universities and how we do things so it's really problematic I think to say that we need to sit down and negotiate something at the international level. What we actually need to do is rethink deeply how we're talking to each other and what kind of language we're using and what it is that we believe in. And you know, so people talk about Amarali, they talk about the casino, corruption. In many, many countries we're at levels of corruption which are not sustainable. We know that once you get, everybody's corrupt to 5%, let's say, but in 10% you can live with. And look at how many countries, including China, perhaps India, 25%, you know, if you try to find some numbers, it doesn't work. The NGO th revolution hasn't really paid off, you know, because it doesn't have power, it only has influence, and it's trying to influence its enemies, so it doesn't work in, a, in many ways. I think we're going to, what, what, what's required now is actually one of those fundamental political renaissance that one got, has had at various times in history, where a whole new group of people come along and change the argument. Now, you know, you've just elected a government here in Delhi. I, I'm not going to say anything serious about that, except that it's interesting that a government could be elected which actually is turning its back on the standard discussion of the last 40 years and saying we're going to do this completely differently. differently. Will they succeed? I have no idea. But I could give you other examples around the world. The, the, the city, a very small city of Reykjavik in Iceland. You know, there are two big parties. They're not bad parties. And a guy comes along who's a stand-up comedian, but brilliant. He starts a party called The Best Party. <laughs> and their principal campaign promise is that he will break all of his promises. <laughs> and, they are, and he gets all the people out of the kind of uh, rock music world and the intellectual world to run with him. And they won overwhelmingly, and he's the best mayor Reykjavik's ever had. And the so, promises? The promises, well, actually, what he's done is, in fact, he's doing things about education, about health care, about housing. And I think that comes back to the thing about, does France and Europe and other Western countries, do they solve the problems of the expenses of the social system by simply cutting back? Or do you sit down and say, how do we do this differently? How do we bring in volunteerism as one of the elements? How do we stop doing so many of the things we do in hospitals in hospitals? How do we recreate the idea of community, which is still understood here, but which has been lost in large parts of Europe? The idea of personal responsibility as opposed to, I paid my taxes, where's the government? And that's not charity. That's personal engagement as a citizen. So I, I really think this is one of those moments where if we get around the corner, it will be because there's been one of those revolutions in political activity and political attitudes, not a continuation of good management, because the good management is not getting us out of the problems. In, in fact, it's getting us into more and more problems. It's solving 
things, we actually have to go to questions. <laughs> well, I have a question for you. Oh, no, don't. <laughs> <laughs> we should ask out here. I okay, think. okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Good morning. I think you have mischaracterized Fukuyama's argument. I think in the wake of the fall of communism, he was suggesting that liberal democracy and some form of market economics were the new unchallenged ideal. Do you have a better idea? that you would formulate at this time, what I've heard seems to be a critique within those ideals. So where specifically would you change political or economic processes? Well, I think your analysis is absolutely right. But he was saying it in a very uh, absolutist way, frankly. And I've, I've been on stages with him. And you know, he has a very clear idea at the time. He's changed his mind since. You know, goes with the goes with the tides, right? Um, uh, but I think a lot of certainly what I was saying was, in fact, a suggestion of other possibilities that are outside of the standard view of the market and the standard view of how democracy works today. There's clearly an enormous need to go back to the basic principles of how do societies function and how do different societies function. And philosophically, do we actually Westerners? have something to learn from outside of the Western philosophical and political tradition. I actually think we do. I think one of our major problems is that we've gone down a road which was that there are universal values and it just happens we invented them. Just a little bit self-serving. <laughs> you know, We got a lot of empires out of that and a lot of money out of that. And, and they're very linear ideas. They're ideas which put human beings on top and, it, and in, a, in a kind of uh, Platonist order and then the earth underneath that. And if you look at the environmental question, for example, and you say, why haven't we been able to make any progress over the last 25 years in negotiations on the environmental crisis? And the principal reason is that the, ne the negotiation has been taking place on the basis of Western principles of economics, of management, of competing interests. And so we couldn't get anywhere. But if you actually look outside and say, are there theories of governance which instead of being linear and utilitarian are circular and spatial and inclusive? There are lots of theories. For example, in Canada, indigenous theories of governance are far more sophisticated than the stuff coming out of our management schools today. Far more sophisticated and far more appropriate to deal with how, how are we going to live with this environmental situation. So I think there are an enormous number of uh, I'll give you one last example. Um, the great victory in the West and in other parts of the world to some extent was of the 20th century was probably that we almost doubled life expectancy. Life expectancy in 1900 in the West was 50 on average, right? according to the international reinsurance industry. And today, a kid born today in the West has a very good chance of a life expectancy on average of 100. We're up around between 80 and 100. So that changes everything. Because the whole system of democracy and uh, the market and management we put in place was put in place in between about 1870 and 1905. And it was all based on life expectancy of 50. And this is a central part of the confusion we have today in economics. Because we're, doing, we're pushing kids through, we're organizing economics, really on the basis of structures which assume that we'll all be dead at 50. So you have to rethink completely, now that we've got part of the world up there and in other parts of the world, certainly classes, middle class in India and so on, moving up in that same direction, how do you rethink that? Where do you take us with that? You go somewhere else. You do it differently. Just a word about Fukuyama. Um, Fukuyama lui-même a corrigé sa, Absolutely. son analyse. Fukuyama corrected his own analysis. Donc, on peut écouter ses propres critiques sur sa vision du début. We can see, we can read about his own criticisms on his own initial viewpoint. No, absolutely. Mm -hmm. But it was too late. 
<laughs> no. I mean, that's the problem, you know. It's, uh, it, when it was ta I did speak to the two heads of the banks the other day, and, and I said, you know, I talked to them about this. And they said, well, you know, in the end, it's all cyclical. I said, yeah. Cyclic. They said, tout ça c'est cyclique. And I said, yeah, the Second World War was cyclical. Thank you. <laughs> you know. Actually, I have an interest in business psychology and using design thinking tools to make business more sustainable so that we can solve some social problems. So I have a question related to this. Do we need to change the way how businesses are working and need to focus more on the human values, value-added production, customer-centric things, emotions, and treating humans as humans not as some objects or machines and valuing more a non-linear, unstructured approach to solve some chaotic social problems. How businesses can play a role in this? Moi, je pense que les, de toute façon, il n'y a pas d'opposition entre les deux. I believe that in any case, there is no opposition between the two. Pour que les affaires marchent bien, il faut que euh, le, la règle de droit soit claire. Uh, if uh, business has to work well, then so the laws have to be followed. Et que euh, la corruption soit la plus faible possible. That corruption should be the lowest possible. Et que euh, on puisse investir dans des conditions euh, correctes sur le plan fiscal. That one should be in a position to be able to invest uh, in a uh, in a, a proper tax uh, scenario. Bon, il faut de la sécurité juridique. Uh, legal security is needed. Et ça, on le trouvera dans toutes les conditions. Que que l'objet de l'entreprise soit excellent ou mauvais, de toute façon, il faut remplir ces conditions. In any case, whether the business objective is good or bad. These conditions are basic prerequisites. Donc, on, moi, je pense pas qu'on puisse opposer. Please, please, all of you, please settle down. Je pense pas qu'on puisse opposer d'un d'un côté euh, le fonctionnement de l'entreprise, autre part les besoins des êtres humains. Il y a aucune contradiction entre les deux. I, I don't see uh, any contradiction between the two, between the functioning of uh, a business and the needs of uh, human beings. I mean, there shouldn't be any contradiction. There should not be. And societies have to be run with various elements in them. But the dominant element in a, civil, in a civilization, not necessarily a democracy, in a civilization, has to be the legitimacy given by people. So in a way, the problematic of the globalist era was that um, everything was argued and defined as if the the measurement factor, the, the eye through which you had to draw the argument, whether it was a cultural argument or an economic or social argument, was economics and a particular school of economics. And by drawing everything through economics, it turned out it was really drawing it through a kind of management, uh, almost mercantilist interpretation of how things run. So I think there's a real need to go back and say, no, actually, the way you have to look at it is, is the good prince it's not just democracy. What is the good prince? What is the good ruler? What is, how does democracy work? But even how does a half-decent semi-dictatorship work? It works through the idea of the legitimacy of the people. And economics, business, plays a big role in that. And there are many different types of businesses. That's the other thing is one has to break up the idea. What are the models of possible business? Some of them are the ones we have. But as I said earlier, I think that we're actually in an era when the old idea of the cooperative, there are already signs of the old idea of the cooperative being reinvented for the new era with new technologies and new ideas. And I think that will play a major role if we go down the right road, because that's an idea of economics which is profoundly local and regional. And the reality is that a lot of things happen in places. You sit down with the, 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 the economists and the business leaders of today, and they're endlessly talking about people have to become more flexible. People have to move around more. And I, I actually remember being in, some, in a university in the southern states with a big conference of people representing four states where they had financial problems. 
And eventually I said to them, so what you're saying is there are about 35 million people in these four states. You're saying 35 million people should go somewhere else. And how would they go there? How would they sell their houses? Because what would the value of the houses be if they went somewhere else? And how would they buy new houses? It's completely a theoretical idea of human beings. We have to go back to the idea that a lot of things are local. A lot of things are regional. Trade is great, but actually most people don't move around. Most people live either where they were born or within not too far, within their country, within their state. So you have to say, how do you make things work for people? It's not an abstract theory, and I think that's perfectly doable. But that's not what's being taught in departments of economics. And the scandal since 2008, because there was a clear lesson, the scandal since 2008 is there has been no change in the teaching in the departments of economics. They're going on as if nothing happened. And that is unbelievably an unbelievable sign of unconsciousness. Ça me permet de, pardon. Ça me permet d'ajouter un mot sur la démocratie. Uh, I would like to add a word on democracy. C'est ça la question, qui décide The question was about who decides. Et est-ce qu'on s'occupe des gens And do we take care of people Si on simplifie le sujet. If we simplify the subject. Dans les pays dans le monde où il n'y a pas encore la démocratie, in the countries les, in the world where the, there is no democracy yet, les gens veulent la démocratie. People want democracy. Dans les pays où il y a la démocratie, countries where there is democracy, tout le monde est toujours mécontent et critique. Everybody is always unhappy and critical. Et en plus, il y a un conflit entre la démocratie représentative classique. And there is always a conflict between the traditional representative democracy On élit des gens, where we elect, elect people, ils font des lois, they make laws, ils, con, ils contrôlent le gouvernement, they control the government. Donc de plus en plus les gens trouvent que c'est pas assez, euh, il faut leur demander leur avis plus souvent. More and more people are of the opinion that, that that that's not enough, uh, that their opinion should be sought out more often. Les gens qu'on a élus ne nous représentent pas bien. That the people that we have elected do not represent us properly. Ils sont tous les mêmes, etc. They are all the same, etc. Uh, et donc il y a une aspiration à une démocratie plus directe. So there is this aspiration for a more direct democracy. Et plus il y a de téléphones portables, et plus il y a de l'internet, etc., plus la pression est forte. And more there are uh, the mobile telephones and internet, the pressure is all the more uh, uh, stronger. Et ça c'est une grosse question sur l'avenir de la démocratie. This is a big uh, question on the future of democracy. Parce que ça peut conduire à relégitimer because this can lead to re-legitimizing revitaliser and revitalizing la démocratie représentative classique uh, the traditional form of representative democracy celle qui a été inventée par les anglais the one which was invented by the british euh, ou alors ça peut la tuer complètement or else it can finish <coughs> it off completely it can kill it si on dit euh, les députés euh, ils nous représentent pas puis ils sont tous corrompus et donc nous allons voter tous les jours avec notre portable. If we start believing that we all our MLAs and MPs are corrupt and they are not doing their job and we start wanting to vote every day on our uh, mobile telephones. Vous, vous arrivez à une sorte de, de chaos démocratique quoi, en fait. We reach a democratic chaos of sorts. Ah. Yeah. So I think... Voilà, donc vous voyez, l'enjeu est important. So, I, I, so you the know, stakes are important. The, the uh, last comment, which is that 25 years, I mean, you're absolutely right. People are looking for a new way to become involved in the public business. Yes. And I think that's been visible since the early 90s. And what's fascinating is that these literary festivals play a central role in it. 25, 30 years ago, there were hardly any literary festivals in the world. This festival was started by three people. And who thought, right? Who thought that people would come? And look at this. Look at all these halls. So what this is about, what your oh. being here is about, <laughs> is you believe in some form of rethinking public participation. And that is really interesting to me. Really interesting and very positive. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Hubert. Thank you, John. And thank you, Padma, for being there.